Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us in Alliances in Disaster Recovery. FEMA and foundations collaborate for long-term resilience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Stephanie Powers, Senior Advisor for Public Policy and Partnerships at the Council on Foundations. Thank you, Caroline, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I am Stephanie Powers, and I will be your host and moderator for this event today. We appreciate you joining us to hear from our community foundation colleagues in the field and our colleagues at FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, about how they have come together to collaborate on disaster recovery planning after some recent major disasters. As most of you on this call already know, the disaster itself may be short-lived, but the recovery is nothing short of long and challenging. To recover successfully from major nat natural disasters, collaboration and coordination of public, private, and philanthropic resources is important to avoid duplication of effort and to deepen the array of supports available to communities. And this is what we're hoping to share with you today, how FEMA dollars and staff on the ground and philanthropy funds and their leadership can work together for greater service and impact in the communities that are suffering. Also, I'm particularly pleased that today you will learn more about FEMA's new position of philanthropic advisor. This is a terrific group of dedicated public servants learning and deepening their knowledge about the role philanthropy can play in helping communities over the long haul of recovery. I encourage you to join in the conversation through the chat function and feel free to post any questions as they come up in the chat or the Q&A box. I will try to weave them into the conversations as the presenter with the presenters as we go along. But later in the program, we'll open the mics for questions and general conversation. Just raise your Zoom hand. First, let me do introductions. Zach Usher is the Acting Deputy Director of the Individual Assistance Division at FEMA. And Zach will talk, will talk to us about how FEMA, how FEMA addresses the individual assistance uh, during um, recovery and uh, how they are making the effort to reduce the barriers to aid for those applicants. And he's also going to highlight FEMA's equity action efforts. Myra Shurd, is a federal coordinating officer for FEMA Region 4 in Atlanta. And prior to just getting on the screen, she said she's in the middle of it. She's in Kentucky right now, uh, uh, responding to the floods uh, in the past week there. But Myra is with us to clarify who the government players are when they land on the ground and who foundations should expect to engage. Denise Morgan Gilliam is the philanthropic advisor in the Recovery Directorate. And Denise will briefly describe the philanthropic advisor role and its history. On our philanthropy panel, we have Chris Dawkins, who is the COO of the Community Foundation of West Kentucky. And she will speak about their kind of newbie status uh, and the learning curve in working with government partners. Giovanni Triseri is the Vice President of Programs of North Valley Community Foundation. And Giovanni is going to talk about their wildfires experience in California and the coordination that they have done with both state emergency management services and FEMA. And he will share his insights after several years of engagement and the funder structures that have emerged as a result of that. Amy Fair is the vice president of donor services at the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee. And Amy will share their experiences in how they've built relationships, how data sharing from FEMA was valuable for the foundation's grant decisions. And it's not just about money to fill gaps. There is important community leadership that philanthropy can exercise when local officials need input on how to plan for a recovery with equity. Foundations are key facilitators to bring non-traditional voices to the decision-making tables. So let's get started. Zach is going to kick us off. Zach? Th 
Thank you, Stephanie, and good afternoon to all of our participants. Uh, appreciate the chance to talk with you all today. My name is Zach Usher. I do serve as the, currently the Acting Deputy Director for Individual Assistance at FEMA. And as I begin to share my screen and bring some slides up, I'll note that individual assistance sounds uh, somewhat te technical and clinical, I think. Um, that's the humanitarian department of FEMA. So individual assistance uh, is really about the humanitarian relief programs uh, that FEMA makes available uh, in partnership with state, tribal, and territorial governments. And so what I'll talk about a little bit over the next couple of minutes uh, is the process by which that type of assistance is, is activated, uh, as well as uh, some of the types of program and assistance that are available. I'll also note some of FEMA's recent focus and, and uh, emphasis on ensuring equity uh, throughout the delivery of our humanitarian assistance programs, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So a great place to start from our perspective is the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency strategic plan, uh, which uh, was recently updated and renewed uh, this year, in fact. And what you can see is that uh, the very first goal within our strategic plan is all about instilling equity as a foundation of emergency management. And practically speaking, uh, this means for us in the humanitarian arena, things like removing barriers to accessing FEMA programs. Um, and there are a number of things that I'll, I'll touch on in this brief talk today uh, to give you some examples of what those sorts of things are. Uh, but uh, absolute emphasis uh, across all the program areas at FEMA uh, about how we achieve equitable outcomes for those in need, for those who we serve. Uh, other priority goals you can see noted here, uh, helping to lead the nation in developing uh, resilience against the hazards of uh, climate and climate change, uh, as well as promoting and sustaining uh, a FEMA that's ready uh, to serve the nation uh, in whatever uh, the nation needs in terms of support. So we'll touch uh, a little bit on, as I noted, how federal disasters uh, get declared, some of the things that are looked at in terms of the individual assistance declaration process, touch on some changes that have been uh, implemented within the program with this focus on, on equity uh, and reducing barriers to assistance, uh, and then touch on a couple of the uh, couple of the ways that FEMA works with our partner organizations uh, to reach those in need uh, through mechanisms like disaster recovery centers, and in particular, talk about some of our staff, known as voluntary agency liaisons, uh, who play a key role in coordinating assistance to individuals, families, and communities. Uh, we've included in the slide deck here a, a link. Uh, we will make these slides available uh, to a video summary uh, of federal assistance that's available after an individual assistance declaration. I'm not gonna push through the video here, uh, but it'll touch on uh, some of the major process steps. Uh, I'm gonna note uh, on the next slide here, uh, some of the factors that are looked at when uh, FEMA uh, receives a request from a, a state, tribe, or territory uh, to provide individual assistance as a, a type of aid in the wake of a disaster. Now, it's really important to note that in the United States, uh, we follow in emergency management a, a very, very specific and, and, and well-documented uh, process whereby emergency management and emergency aid uh, is always principally and primarily delivered at the local level, the level closest possible to the event. Uh, and in our framework, when local resources are overwhelmed, uh, a state, a tribe, or a territorial uh, level government uh, will become involved and provide assistance. And the, in the event that uh, that state, tribe, or territory is overwhelmed, in turn, uh, the federal government, um, sometimes through FEMA, as well as through other federal agencies, can provide assistance. But what FEMA does in, in coordinating with states, tribes, and territories uh, to uh, consider what types of aid might be needed uh, is consider a variety of factors. We call them declaration factors uh, that serve to document the impacts of a disaster event on a community and on a state. And you can see some of them noted here, things like the fiscal capacity of a state, uh, what's the economic capacity of a state uh, to absorb, repair, recover from a particular event. Uh, what has the impact been uh, on individuals and their families in terms of personal property losses, um, what might be covered by insurance, what might not be covered by insurance, 
uh, factors related to casualties caused by the disaster event, uh, among others. So FEMA examines in coordination with our state counterparts these factors and ultimately makes a recommendation to the president uh, as the leader of the executive branch and the president will make a determination as to whether individual assistance uh, is warranted based on the consideration of these factors. And in the event that the, the president does issue a disaster declaration, uh, that then starts to make a variety of forms of assistance available to help individuals. When we talk about humanitarian relief from, from FEMA and in particular, uh, what's known as our individual and households program, there are some general conditions of eligibility that are, are, are helpful to keep in mind in terms of uh, who is intended to benefit from, uh, from the assistance. Uh, you can see some of these basic conditions of eligibility here in terms of uh, being a US citizen, uh, non-citizen national or qualified alien. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out from this slide and that I think is important to note uh, is that the aid that's delivered through FEMA um, must be directly caused by a declared disaster. And um, that, that can be at times somewhat challenging to work through because you may have uh, individuals, communities that had challenges um, of a variety of uh, natures prior to an event. Uh, and sometimes in a, a disaster event will exacerbate some of those uh, challenges, whether they be socioeconomic or other. Um, but from a, a statutory, from a legal perspective, uh, FEMA must ensure that the aid that's being provided through the individual assistance program uh, is caused by a declared disaster. The other key element that's worth noting is that insurance or other forms of disaster assistance uh, take precedence in terms of addressing an applicant or a survivor's unmet needs. Essentially what this means is the FEMA aid is supplemental, it's not primary. Uh, and so in some cases, uh, there are processes that uh, an individual or their family will have to move through uh, in order to demonstrate that they've exhausted insurance benefits to, to access other FEMA aid. I'll mention a couple of the types of programs uh, that FEMA offers uh, in the event of an individual assistance declaration. Um, we do a tremendous amount of work uh, prior to events and immediately after events supporting our voluntary organization, our non-governmental organization partners uh, who perform much of the mass care work in the United States. Uh, these are activities like disaster sheltering, feeding, uh, providing other resources immediately after an event. Uh, typically FEMA is not operating those shelters or, or running those operations, but we're supporting with expertise, with staff, in some cases with financial support or with uh, supplies and materials. Uh, we also provide a variety of forms of assistance through our individual and households program uh, to individuals and households impacted by a particular event. Uh, this can include uh, grants uh, that are available to assist with home repair or replacement. Uh, can also include uh, the placement at times of what we call direct housing. Uh, these can be manufactured housing units. These can be uh, other forms of transportable temporary housing uh, to try to ensure that disaster survivors have a, a safe place to, uh, to stay uh, in the days and months after a disaster event as they work through their recovery process. Uh, FEMA also uh, has the ability to fund uh, disaster case management, uh, whereby a state, tribe, or territory will design a program uh, to hire disaster case managers who will work with a family uh, for months or years after a disaster event to try to help them navigate federal programs, other assistance programs uh, on there as they move through their recovery. Uh, and you see other programs listed as well, which um, on each disaster event will be considered as far as whether they are, uh, whether they are necessary uh, to help further the recovery effort. Uh, and that's very much a cooperative conversation between FEMA and our, our state, tribe, or territorial partners. Wanted to note uh, a couple of reasons why applicants are, are sometimes ineligible for disaster assistance. Um, and I'll just touch on one of these here. Uh, the number one reason is that uh, we find after a disaster occurs uh, and a registration uh, for disaster assistance has, uh, has been taken, uh, FEMA will perform a, what's known as a housing inspection. Um, and it's not uncommon for upon that inspection for the FEMA inspector to determine uh, that a survivor's home might be safe to occupy, doesn't necessarily require repairs. And so that has some implications in terms of what uh, a disaster survivor may be eligible for. Uh, and you can see other, other reasons noted here. Uh, 
oftentimes, uh, as you look further down the list, of, uh, it can be a question of providing documentation, of providing verification uh, of certain basic eligibility requirements for FEMA programs. Uh, I mentioned equity as being a, a, a truly a foundational part a, a, or area of emphasis for FEMA uh, under our current strategic plan. Um, and wherever possible, looking to enhance access, reduce barriers to accessing FEMA assistance. Uh, thinking about what I showed you on the last slide, you'll note that uh, documentation is sometimes a challenge in terms of being able to demonstrate eligibility. So recently, we've made some significant changes in some of the ways that uh, a homeowner, for example, could document ownership of a particular uh, structure that might be damaged by a disaster event. One example I'll give you is uh, we now accept major repair bills uh, as a way to demonstrate ownership of a home. Uh, that was not traditionally something that FEMA was able to do, but we've made changes. Uh, the rationale being, if you can demonstrate through receipts from a contractor that you've invested in uh, a furnace, some other major system in a, in a structure, um, we can use that to document uh, that, that you are the owner of that particular structure. Uh, and use that to qualify individuals for disaster assistance. And that's, that's the type of change that is making a difference as we speak, as we work through disaster responses uh, in places like K Kentucky, uh, that is making a difference for some individuals to be able to demonstrate eligibility and access assistance. Uh, we've noted a couple of others in here. Um, I won't go into detail on them today, but uh, as I noted, we'll have this slide deck available uh, and so across our program, uh, we are trying to identify uh, areas where uh, we can meet the needs of those who've been impacted, where possible, reduce the documentation burden, understanding that in the wake of a disaster event, documentation and building, uh, building the case for disaster assistance, we need, we need to make that uh, as reasonably accessible as possible uh, to those that have a need for that aid. Um, here you also see uh, some notes in terms of uh, changes to uh, how we are looking at documenting eligibility. Uh, there's more we can do now than we could uh, several years ago uh, in terms of pulling, uh, pulling automated data. We, another uh, aspect of things that we do now uh, is we will, when an individual registers for disaster assistance, uh, take a look at any previous disaster registrations for that same address. Uh, and we will try wherever possible to use information uh, if unfortunately they've been impacted by a disaster before where they were aided by FEMA uh, to utilize that documentation uh, so that we don't have to necessarily ask for that again. Uh, so there are a number of things we've done uh, recently, uh, really all of it in the spirit of uh, trying to reduce barriers to uh, accessing our programs. Um, and and I'm, I'm pleased to say we are starting to see positive results from that. Uh, what I'll close with is just some notes on uh, a couple of the, the ways in which FEMA uh, provides opportunities for disaster survivors and the public to interface uh, with FEMA staff, um, often after a disaster event occurs in conjunction with a, a state or tribe or territory. Uh, FEMA will work to set up disaster recovery centers. These are uh, physical sites where individuals can come and meet with FEMA staff, can meet with staff from uh, state and local government, voluntary organizations that are assisting after a disaster uh, to ask questions, provide documentation, uh, learn about other benefits that may be available. Uh, and those disaster recovery centers are an important way uh, to provide another, another access point um, to FEMA representatives for disaster survivors. Finally, I'll note uh, the, the staff, we have a group of staff within FEMA known as our voluntary agency liaisons who play a, a very unique role uh, in that their, their year-round job is to develop relationships between the federal government and partner organizations uh, who help assist in times of disaster response and recovery. Uh, our voluntary agency li liaisons, we describe it as having one foot firmly in the federal government space and then one foot outside of the government space. Uh, they serve as, as links uh, between our partner organizations, uh, the federal government, other federal agencies, trying to ensure uh, that data, access to information, in some cases access to disaster sites is as easy as possible for our partners so that the resources those partner organizations can bring to bear uh, can, can be added to other forms of assistance to try to help people work through their recovery. Uh, so appreciate the chance to share a little bit of this today. Uh, Stephanie, I'll hand the microphone uh, back over to you and uh, thanks for the time. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so I see questions are coming in. Um, and we could probably spend the entire rest of the session on answering questions. Let me um, see if this everybody's happy with this. Um, I'm going to ask maybe one question now, Zach, or maybe two. Um, and then any questions that we don't answer, I promise we will get them to FEMA and have FEMA answer them for you, and we will even email them back to you. So you can keep the questions coming. I just don't know if we can actually uh, answer all of them. There was an early question uh, earlier in your presentation, Zach, from Meredith. She wanted to know if any of those factors you had mentioned early on uh, were weighted more heavily than others. Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, no, I would not say that one is is weighted more heavily than others. Really, the intent there with those factors is try to ensure that uh, that FEMA and ultimately the president is taking a, a holistic look uh, at not just the, the economics and physical impact of the disaster, which is estimated through things like uh, data on insurance or state uh, state economic uh, capacity. Uh, but also uh, considerations around casualties and impact on community infrastructure. So, no, I wouldn't say that one is weighed more than more than the others. It's very much a, 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 a sum of some of the parts looking across those different dimensions of the, the impacts of the event. Uh, OK, and then I'll pick one more. Um, so this is a question from Joshua. He says, if a nonprofit is repairing the house of a displaced household, then does this not lessen the chances of the household receiving FEMA help under the individual assistance program? Why would the household accept the home repair help from the nonprofit if that meant that might disqualify them or they couldn't receive the FEMA um, assistance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, I will share that in my experience, uh, typically the uh, assistance that an individual and a, and, or a family are gonna receive through FEMA may not meet all of the needs uh, that are presented, uh, especially if uh, insurance was not present or they were underinsured. And so in that instance, what we would recommend is that that family register for FEMA assistance, uh, be considered for the, the maximum benefits there, um, but also note that it's very likely that the FEMA assistance may not um, by law, be able to completely uh, return them to their pre-disaster state. Uh, and that's where I think we particularly see uh, value in what voluntary organizations can do in addition to assistance that's available from FEMA. Uh, now, the, the process uh, by which registration occurs and a FEMA determination is made um, is, I'm going to say, relatively uh, quick on the scale of weeks to weeks to months uh, in terms of that determination. But often we see, and Stephanie noted this in her opening, the recovery process being one of not months, but years. And we see those voluntary organizations sometimes working with families that did receive aid from FEMA, uh, but it may not have uh, completely uh, restored or returned them to uh, you know, some uh, something approaching their pre-disaster uh, state and condition. And so they'll work with that family for, as I said, sometimes years uh, after the disaster event, in addition to the aid that was received from FEMA. Um, but it is important to know that from a, a, a legal perspective, by law, FEMA can't duplicate aid that's been provided from another place. And so timing matters, and there's some intricacy around working through that. Um, one of our uh, position types, the voluntary agency liaisons, who I talked about just a little bit, one of the key things they do after a disaster event is make contact with voluntary, non-governmental, faith-based organizations that intend to do recovery work and try to ensure that those organizations get the data and information they need to make informed decisions about who they're going to help, who they're going to reach out to about additional aid. So. Uh, that information sharing process and, and information sharing exchange that our VALs help to catalyze is a very important part of the coordination after a declaration occurs. Great. Thanks, Zach. Um, so I think you can see we could really get deep into these conversations and um, we can, I'd like to be able to move on right now. Zach, there are some questions and in the chat that maybe you could answer. Um, while I move on, uh, 
to Myra. Um, Myra, who's on the ground with you in Kentucky and who should foundations be talking to there? So <laughs> thanks a lot, Stephanie. Right now here in Kentucky, we have our federal disaster recovery officer. We're going to bring in the philanthropic advisor, as you've mentioned. And those are the folks that will really be able to give you the issues and connect you with um, the, the issues and the folks and communities that are in need of support. Uh, I'm so excited that we have Amy from Middle Tennessee and Chris from West Kentucky, because in Middle Tennessee, Tennessee, we actually had our FDRO, a Federal Disaster Recovery Officer, who was critical in making some of those connections. And here in Western Tennessee, I'm sure Denise Gilliam was the one that was championing all of that. So there are those folks. Now, it's not always as easy to just, hey, pick up a phone and call the Joint Field Office. Sometimes that may take a little bit of legwork, but you're normally, we're going to reach out. We're definitely going to try to reach out. But but also during your steady state time, look into your state emergency management officer, find those folks, the voluntary agency liaisons are working within your communities already. So those people will be able to connect you to the FEMA partner so that you might be able to start making a strategy for the humanitarian side, as well as some of the infrastructure needs that a community might have. Great, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mara. And um, I guess I want to ask Denise if she can um, come off camera and and talk about the um, philanthropic advisors. Um, I think this is a good connection that foundations need to understand is there now. Um, Denise and her colleagues who have this title are there to really answer these kinds of questions. So there's actually a dedicated person now group of people at FEMA the foundations can can talk to. Denise, could you just talk a little bit about the role and that'll be kind sure. of our lead in into our conversation with our philanthropy uh, panel too? Sure, thanks so much, Stephanie. And I, I just wanna say Stephanie has always been so helpful whenever a disaster happens and we're deployed to the field, we can reach out to her and she can make those connections. And those of you who, who are from community foundations know that when that introduction happens, um, it's usually a very quick uh, access to those folks and we and we talk very, you know, very soon after that introduction is made. We currently have about 14 uh, people on the staff um, in what we call our cadre. Those are actual female employees, whether they're full time employees or uh, reservist program. And so um, as of a couple of days ago, 14 was the number, which is really exciting for me because I did it for about 10 years by myself. Um, and so it, it was it was extremely busy. And as uh, Zach mentioned, the role of the voluntary agency liaison is kind of been the link to all that. And that is actually where I started. And basically what happened was I realized very quickly when we were going into communities after disasters to, to form uh, recovery groups and work in long term recovery, that the community foundations were really the thought leaders in those communities and they had the ability to convene and were incredible collaborators. So I started very quickly um, contacting them when I was deployed and bringing them to the table really as that leadership role in the community. And they were always so wonderful and generous with their ability to convene meetings uh, of these nonprofits and they already knew who was who in the community. So it just, it started there as being so helpful. And then um, working at FEMA headquarters as a voluntary agency liaison, I met Stephanie and we just brainstormed about, well, wow, wouldn't it be great for all of our federal agency partners to have someone in that role and be able to come together? And, and Stephanie was hosting uh, quarterly meetings for that for many, many years and continues to do that. So we, we have just feel so fortunate for that relationship. And um, it, it actually has led us to really be able to share uh, information widely when things happen and, and really just have Stephanie be able to connect us very quickly um, to those communities that we are engaged in. So it's it's just been a really super helpful and, and rewarding relationship. And 
Um, so we've, we've gone from there and I've had the privilege to work all over the country with many uh, different community foundations and um, you know attend many convenings. And I, I just want to throw in there, we, a colleague and I, one of the voluntary agency liaisons went to the philanthropy Northwest uh, conference in Montana several years ago. And everyone there was very friendly and very nice, but they kept asking us, well, you're FEMA, why are you here? <laughs> you know, we, <you're, laughs> we, we don't know what we have to do with you. And by the time the, the conference was over, we had made many, many new contacts and friends. And I think that's, that's sort of what happens. Um, people learn a lot more about FEMA and uh, we learn a lot more about what their roles are in the community. So we're just super happy that we've been able to do this work. I always call it the best job at FEMA. So. <laughs> and I think um, probably those people in um, who attended that conference uh, up in the Northwest have experienced quite a few disasters uh, since that time. So, um, yes. you know, as we all know now, and, and we certainly have talked about this at Council on Foundation conferences, and I'm sure other uh, other kinds of philanthropy serving organization conferences, affinity groups. Um, it could be anybody's community now, um, given what is happening with, with climate. So um, we think everybody should be prepared and everybody in our membership and certainly in the foundation sector should know that there is this direct connection now um, to FEMA at the headquarters level uh, with people who are really studying how to, how to collaborate with, with the philanthropy community. So I, I really appreciate that whole crew now. We're having great fun trying to figure out some cool solutions to things. So, so to that, and um, I want to just uh, acknowledge there were a couple of questions in the Q and A chat. Um, Erica, you uh, posed a question, but I'm going to save that. I think for one of our our panelists um, to answer. And Meredith, I think we'll get to your question um, at the end. And Al, same thing with yours. So um, I'd like to move on so we can hear from our colleagues in the community foundation world. Um, and I'm gonna ask Giovanni uh, to start. Um, Giovanni has been out battling wildfires for quite a few years, have you not? And I think you might be on mute. Yes, thank you so much, Stephanie. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, this is such an important topic and something that I feel very passionate about. Um, the North Valley Community Foundation um, is located in Northern California. We cover the counties of Butte, Glen, Tehama, Calusa, and now Plumas. And it was in 2018 that we uh, really were launched into this disaster recovery world. Um, uh, North Valley Community Foundation became the philanthropic hub of the campfire that devastated the town of Paradise and the surrounding areas. I listed some uh, some things that uh, of note of that fire. Um, it was very devastating, something that uh, no community really had been prepared for. Um, and so we uh, needed to grow in our capacity to be able to meet what the needs were. We became that, like I mentioned, that philanthropic hub uh, where we not only raised money, but helped other foundations across the country direct their funds uh, to the right places because of the community we had built. Um, we had, um, this is a little snapshot of uh, to date where our funding has gone to. A lot of it in the direct assistance, um, and that continues to be that case. Uh, I know that question had come up of uh, how do you not uh, uh, supplant or uh, conflict with the FEMA funding that comes in. A simple way that we've done it is we are part of a unmet needs roundtable that uh, is really cases that are presented by the disaster case managers. They have gone through with those homeowners, those renters, uh, the complex web of recovery. And once they have exhausted all other possibilities, they come to the round table where we have other funders come and uh, present a case to meet those unmet needs for housing, for repairs. I could be something as simple as uh, getting some work done on their driveway or uh, the, their stairs to a complete uh, home rebuild. Um, and so it, it uh, spans quite a bit. Um, 
We learned a lot uh, in 2018, and we also then, uh, because here in Northern California, you've seen a lot of those fires. Um, in 2020, we had the Bear Fire, or that became the North Complex fires here in Butte County and surrounding counties. And then last year, the devastating uh, Dixie Fire. Um, we became the philanthropic hubs for those disasters, and we are very much in the thick of it still a year out with the Dixie Fire while we are still engaged in the other recovery efforts. Uh, this disaster was a little bit different, but the thing I would want to focus on the, our role here with FEMA has been one of the things we learned was collaborating with other funders, uh, not being the only ones that are there, but really sharing information and uh, leveraging each other's resources. We, in a disaster, we want to maximize the efforts that uh, com our communities could bring into a disaster by first raising the funds. And so, uh, we decided we're not going to be a, uh, we're, there's not a competition, there's not anybody can raise funds for this. We helped uh, leverage our resources with communication staff and social media to highlight where people could give so that we can maximize that effort. And then we came together as a funding uh, funders roundtable to look at the needs. We became that uh, hub where we had one application. Um, and we would disperse that to all the funders. Uh, we would have one report uh, that if we needed one um, down the road so that the, that uh, people who need organizations who were responding did not have to go to multiple locations, but really one place. And that would really leverage our funding where we could share some of those resources and split uh, the, the funding of a particular grant. Uh, FEMA and the California Op Office of, Edu um, of Emergency Services are part of that Funders Roundtable to really give us insights. Um, and one thing that we've learned is uh, some of the things that FEMA, uh, what we gained from working with FEMA, is that they have a national network of philanthropic uh, partners who've been in our, sh in our shoes. And so uh, for some of the first things were connecting us to people, for, that was early on in the 2018 fire. Uh, we were able to be in touch with so many foundations who had already gone through that and learned lessons so that we didn't start from scratch. And FEMA really became a really big part of that. To the insights into, uh, they gave us insights into what was covered by federal funding and state funding, and they would be able to advocate for the gaps. Uh, in the 2018 fire, the disaster case management was very inadequate. We only had 16 case managers for thousands of cases. And so we, had, uh, we were trying to do some advocacy. That was all fixed for the Dixie Fire and the Dixie Fire uh, disaster case management team is well funded and, and fully engaged, but we work with them. Uh, data sharing to help with grant decisions so that we're not duplicating funding or doing funding where the uh, communities can get them uh, elsewhere. And then also with a knowledge base of available grants to help community foundations. Um, I, I'll try, I know there's others that I want to hear from as well, but I'll uh, share. We do have a disaster recovery blueprint for philanthropic organizations that I will also uh, drop in the chat here. Um, for the direct link if you're interested in knowing some of the other lessons that we've learned. Oh, great. Thanks very much, Shivani. Um, I'm, I'm sort of looking at a little bit on the chat. I know somebody had asked, how do you find those voluntary liaisons? Um, and uh, let's see. I know you can find them on the FEMA website. And maybe, Caroline, you could go in and see if you could find them for us and post it. Stephanie, this is Zach. I'll be posting that momentarily. Oh, wonderful, Zach. Thank you very yeah. much. And I would say, um, hey, uh, to our panelists, if you have not changed your chat to everyone, you won't be able to see all these different questions that are being answered. Um, and feel free to go right in, you, you FEMA folks, and start answering those questions. Appreciate it. Uh, great. Okay, so next, um, we're going to hear from Amy. So, Amy, um, Talk to us about what your experience has been, because uh, I know you have a you were had, had a little different twist on on your experience when I I called to ask you about this. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, thanks so much. Uh, what I will say is, 
for us, we are based in Nashville, but we serve a 40 county area. So we have urban, suburban, and rural communities. Uh, for us, since March of 2020, uh, we have experienced um, and been involved with five different disasters, four of them natural, one of them man-made, um, and they have spanned um, several of our counties. And so in many ways, because of the different type of organization or different type of disasters and the different locations that were impacted, I think we've gotten a really expanded lens into the work of FEMA. Um, I know a number of people from FEMA since March of 2020 uh, that cover a lot of ground. And there were even points in um, our most recent flood disaster in a rural county when someone reached out to me um, that was very proactive. And, and that's what I can say about FEMA. Um, they've been very proactive in so many ways in reaching out to the local community. And that's something that i I don't know that I expected only because I didn't have um, a lot of experience, but I got a call and I was like, well, wait, this person is my FEMA person for this disaster. And this person is my FEMA person for this disaster, but know that there really are a great number of people that have incredible experience and knowledge. Um, and it's very likely whatever disaster that you may be experiencing in your community, um, just as Giovanni said, uh, there is someone in FEMA that can show you a way um, to get there more quickly uh, with the information and knowledge. Um, I'll use an example. Uh, our August 2021 flooding, which occurred in some more rural counties in the western part of our service area, um, we had a lot of great proactive work. It was a significant disaster. And so there were a lot of different federal agencies on the ground. Um, and FEMA has really been instrumental in um, pulling in other federal agencies, helping us in our understanding of what are those other federal dollars that are available, whether it's from Health and Human Services or some other activities um, kind of outside the individual assistance side. There's something also known as public assistance that affects the community, but ultimately trickles down to the benefit of individuals. And so um, certainly one of the things for FEMA, you'll get used to a lot of acronyms, um, but I would encourage anyone that's going to be working in this disaster space to really become interested, ask questions. Um, there are such great resources with FEMA um, and just having those conversations and relationships. Myra mentioned it. I, I can't remember what she referenced it as the calm down time or something like that. We talk a lot uh, in our community about blue skies um, and what do we do during blue skies so that we're prepared and we have everything in place. Um, so that we're ready. I think if you look at the sort of disaster cycle, we're running, running, running on the relief and recovery phase. And a lot of times we let the preparedness fall by the wayside. Um, and I, I can't emphasize enough um, really spending that time when you're not in the middle of disaster for planning for the next one, because what, what we've known and what we've seen all over is that there will be a next one. Um, the other um, point I want to make is, and someone mentioned uh, this, it's not just FEMA, um, right? There are lots of state agencies. There are state VOADs, um, voluntary organizations active in disaster that you can be part of. Um, if you come upon a disaster, another great resource, there are many great community and faith-based organizations that have experience with FEMA, um, that have been through disasters before and connecting with them um, so that really the goal is always trying to shorten the time between getting people assistance and um, when the disaster occurs. Uh, one additional great resource that I'll mention, um, we had a December 2021 
tornado that affected us. Of course, obviously, Chris will talk a lot about how that tornado impacted Western Kentucky, um, but Middle Tennessee is really on a path uh, right before there. Um, in our local Nashville community, um, there was some initial work done by our Office of Emergency Management and some nonprofits to assess damage. And we really did not find damage in the community. And it was only because of FEMA reaching out to us and sharing with us about the data that they had received from applications from our community that said, hey, Nashville, you might wanna take another look at your local community. And because of that information, we did some initial assessment with our disaster case management organization, did some outreach and discovered not a huge number of individuals that were impacted, um, but ones that the local community didn't have sight of, but FEMA um, had sight of in their work in the disaster. Um, so that, is one important thing. The, the final point that I will make is that um, Zach talked a little bit about it, the different types of disaster declarations, because they are different. We've seen across the four natural disasters um, that uh, have been declared in our community that they've, I don't know what FEMA calls it, different levels of disaster, um, but knowing the difference between sort of the more destructive, you can see it right away, disaster happening. Um, the type of declaration that FEMA has sometimes can cause some leveraging of some uh, government dollars for things like rebuilding. Um, so again, my helpful hints would be, be a learner, understand the system. If you're gonna be in this disaster work, get to understand more about FEMA build those relationships. Like Denise said, it's really all year long. Um, and Myra said during the blue skies, the calm down time, um, but we're all in this together. Uh, FEMA couldn't be successful without the local community dollars. The local community dollars couldn't be um, successful in recovery without the FEMA dollars. So it really takes all of us in response. Great, thanks uh, very much, Amy. Um, we're gonna move to Chris now. And um, Chris, I think, did I get it right? This is your first disaster? <laughs> yes, we are in West Kentucky and we are walking through our learning experience right now. Um, my name's Chris and I'm with the Community Foundation of West Kentucky. Uh, on December 10th, a tornado moved through our region and left a mile wide path of destruction diagonally across the west portion of the state, leaving 16 counties in West Kentucky eligible for individual assistance. This was our first major disaster across the region, and the topic of discussion for us has really been one that's around preparedness of the local nonprofit sector. What we found out is that uh, we were lacking the knowledge and understanding of the sector's role in the long-term recovery process. We feel a community foundation is perfectly poised to assist with long-term recovery efforts because identifying community needs, connecting with resources and donors, and supporting overall community development goals falls under the scope of our normal operations. The FEMA philanthropic advisors were instrumental in providing us with knowledge and understanding of the disaster recovery framework that we needed to position our communities to receive the available resources. Their support also allowed us to remain in a forward-facing position, tending to the needs of our communities as they identified available funding across the state and national partners. It truly felt to us as if they had our back as we worked to support our citizens. Moving forward, we have um, now have the knowledge and the tools available to us to help us instill preparedness in our local nonprofit network so that next time none of us are caught off guard. And if there's one thing I can tell you that we have learned about disaster recovery is that recovery begins before the disaster even happens. Great, thank you. Um, and so I, I wanna just pick up on that point because um, 
Amy also mentioned this, I think, uh, but it, it's about this preparedness piece. And I just wonder if the community foundations uh, could, if any of you, maybe talk about what you have in your mind's eye about preparedness now that you've had, you know, you've had the, the experience of the real impact. Um, you know, what would you, what, what are you doing or what should you be doing? Uh, Amy, you just turned on your camera, so you want to respond? Right. Um, for us, uh, one of the things we did, we um, had experienced a thousand year flood in May of 2010 um, in Nashville. And for a time after that disaster, we had a local uh, VOAD group. Um, voluntary organizations active in disaster. Um, but right, like like with any of us, if we go without a disaster for too long, you know, things fall off. We, we had the group that really um, didn't stay alive because there were so many years in between the next disaster. So it was in 2020 when it was the 10 year anniversary of the flood that we said, you know, a lot of people were talking about, let's look back the anniversary. And we talked about with some other nonprofit organizations, let's, let's look ahead. The best and most important thing we can do is prepare for the next one. And I'm not kidding, like literally the day before the March, 2020 tornado hit, um, we had sort of a reinitiate reinitiation VOAD group. Um, since then, uh, through the disasters over the course of two years, we now have a 41 member organization that is reinvigorated um, and understands the real importance of preparedness. Um, we have commitment at the highest level. Um, we at the Community Foundation have established a fund. Um, we have a, a group of funds called Public-Private Partnership Funds, and one of them being um, we have our Nashville VOAD Leadership Fund uh, that we're with the other nonprofits helping raising money for continuing education and engagement of our nonprofit community so we're prepared for whatever the next thing is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Giovanni or Chris, yeah. Chris, do you want us to respond to that too? Go yeah, ahead. well, one thing I would say to, to prepare now is um, develop good relationships with uh, other area funders. Um, and this is a good time to, to really have a plan together. What, what could it look like if you uh, did things uh, perhaps differently than you have before? Um, when a disaster strikes, what could the role of philanthropic uh, organizations be together? Um, and um, and in, instead of any, com if there's any competitive areas or issues that may have been in the past, I think this is a time to really work on those relationships uh, because the community needs strong collaborative relationships and will benefit from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like, um, it sounds like maybe it just makes sense as kind of part of doing business of having a plan um, already in place on how funders will quickly come together when something happens. Um, be a good idea. Absolutely. Chris, I know you were put your camera on and then went back off. So you want to respond to that? I echo both of them. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I didn't understand what you said. Oh, I, said I, 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 I echo, echo both of them. Echo yes. both I of agree them. I agree 100% with what they have okay. to say. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, I, there was a, a question in here, uh, and this might this is a question for FEMA. So uh, maybe Zach, um, Denise, um, Al had asked a question about um, how difficult it is for an individual to do the application process with the SBA, I guess, um, for small must be small business loans to repair small business. Um, has FEMA ever considered an alternative? <clears throat> individuals through low interest loans it's not so complicated look you're laughing because you guys probably have trouble with the sba right <laughs> uh, we have trouble with the name i i think i'll let zach take this one but i, I just want to throw in you know we have debated this for years we 
we know it's a problem, but I, I'm going to let Zach take it as the expert on this one now. <laughs> Go right. ahead, Zach. Thanks, Denise. Yes. Um, so in the what what we in the federal government call the sequence of delivery of federal disaster assistance, when when there's individual assistance, humanitarian aid that's authorized, um, that is almost always in conjunction with another federal agency, the Small Business Administration, also issuing uh, a disaster declaration for disaster assistance. And the requirement is that for an individual uh, who is registering with FEMA to be considered for all of the potential aid and forms of assistance that FEMA is authorized to deliver, they have to register with FEMA and then after providing some documentation, be evaluated by the Small Business Administration for a low interest loan as a primary means of helping them recover. In the event that they do not qualify for taking out that, that low interest loan through the Small Business Administration, they're then referred back to FEMA for further consideration. So that's why you, you see in terms of messaging after a disaster, there will be significant outreach that goes on trying to explain that in order for an individual to access all of the benefits they could be eligible for from FEMA, they must register with FEMA. Then FEMA takes their information, actually provides it to the Small Business Administration for consideration there. Uh, and depending on availability to pay, credit, other factors, their, their next offer of assistance from the federal government might be a low interest loan from the Small Business Administration, uh, even though it's not a loan necessarily for a business that they run. And that's where some of the, the language becomes problematic. Um, or they may not qualify for that loan, be referred back to FEMA for consideration for what's, what's known as other needs assistance through FEMA, uh, essentially additional aid. Um, that, uh, that process, which is governed uh, by requirements from, uh, uh, from a, a legal standpoint, from the statutes that our respective organizations work under, is, is challenging. We try to do a lot of outreach on it, um, but there, I agree with the, the person asking the question. There continues to be some challenges in, uh, there's a natural reaction to, well, I'm not a small business and I'm not asking for a loan. I need help. But by regulation, we have to work through that evaluation process at FEMA, referral to the Small Business Administration, then ultimately, um, in some cases, uh, the case moves back over to FEMA for consideration for additional benefits. So um, it's not it's not hard to imagine how the applicant feels in the ping pong in the mm -hmm. federal government. Yes, right, and and, and even in the, even in the language, right? Yes, of, right. I'm not a small right. business owner. Why am I? I've never I may have never in, interfaced with the Small Business Administration before in my life. Why why do I need to? Mm -hmm. To, to do that. And, and some of it is this philosophy that I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, that this federal aid is, is supplemental and there's, there's, uh, there is a legal process we have to work through to ensure no duplication of, of assistance. Um, and right. and that, is a, that is a communication challenge that we continue to, right. to work through. Right. Well, um, we've, we're at the end of our time here. We have about a minute left, actually. We're right at three o'clock. Uh, and we do have more questions here. I just want to acknowledge, I guess, Meredith, we owe you an answer. We're going to owe Brittany an answer, I think. Laura um, asked a question about renters. So there's several in here we'll call out. I will send those over to my colleagues at FEMA and have them answer those and we'll send those back out to you as well and i would say to any of the foundations that are on the call um you can feel free to email me at the council um my email is just stephanie.powers at cof.org and i'm happy to forward any questions or connect you to the philanthropy advisors um, I think there's a lot more conversation. I had a lot of questions about preparedness and FEMA's role in that. Um, so hopefully maybe we can do this another time and dig in on another part of the topic. I wanna thank um, Chris and Amy and Giovanni for sharing their experiences. I've probably created a little work for you now. You're gonna get emails as well. <laughs> but 
<laughs> we need that peer-to-peer -peer learning that goes on as well. So um, uh, thanks to uh, my colleagues, uh, certainly at FEMA for doing this. And um, if you'd like to hear um, you know, other issues, other particulars about FEMA and, and the assistance with disasters, please let me know and um, we'll think about doing, um, you know, another one of these conversations maybe a little bit later in the year. And I wish everybody a very safe uh, hurricane season uh, since we're deep in the hurricane season. Um, and hopefully we don't have to get back on to talk about any impacted communities. Um, so I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the afternoon and thank you very much for being with us.